by our <laughs> by our automated voice recording system, uh, by our tremendous cover and teacher, Rabbi Mary mm -hmm. Alcabaz, who uh, comes to visit us every so often and such as a for us. Mary always brings with him Torah from Yerushalayim, mm -hmm. and he brings he brings simcha, he brings a smile, and he always lifts us up. And we're always incredibly grateful whenever he comes and, and spends time with us. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Abner el from the Bishal Thank you. Thank you. And just for the record, we'll start off a joke to make okay. Um, how do we know that Noah's Ark had the revolving door that you have at the mikveh? I, I hope you guys will get the joke. You know, the, the white mikveh is a revolving door. How do we know that the, Noah's Ark had a revolving door? Because the verse says they went in shtime, shtime, two at a time. Uh, <laughs> you didn't get it, right? No. Because no. the men's mikveh has a revolving door. And people like cheating, they're going two at a time. So in Noah's Ark, it said that animals came two at a time. So, okay. That was one joke. I know. Bo Hashem. Okay. Now, now a woman's joke. A lady calls her husband. And he says, yes, dear. And she says, tell me a joke, please. And it's like a religious couple. So the husband says, my honey, I'm learning now in Kolel. You know, what are you calling me for a joke? She said, right. Tell me another joke also, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was it, the break dice. Okay, we cannot start without talking about what has happened in the world. And the world is still shocked. We're still shocked because technically the year starts on Simchat Torah. To explain. Wow. Boji boji, that's big. Okay, uh, the year technically starts on Hosh on Simchat Torah. Why is that? The day before Simchat Torah is called Hoshana Raba. Hoshana, the Ben Ishra explains, is broken down into two words. Hosha, save us. Na, na means please, but also na has the gematria of fifty one. Noon is fifty. Aleph is one. What's fifty one? Fifty one of the days from the beginning of Elu. So that's 30 days, plus the first 21 days of the month of Tishrei. So that's 51. Meaning what? That after all the preparation for repentance, for having a good year, to be on Hashem's good side, that He tips the scale for merit, which we start already from Rosh Chodesh Elul. So the culmination is on this day, Hoshana Rabbah. Even though the Day of Judgment is Rosh Hashanah, and we know, Tzadikim are inscribed immediately for life on Rosh Hashanah. The wicked are inscribed immediately for death on Rosh Hashanah. The people in between are given until Yom Kippur. Okay? The Benonim. But like the, the, the sages teach, the, the Takim, the actual issuing of the edict is given out on Hoshana Rabbah. That's why Hoshana Rabbah is a day of repentance. People have the custom to wear again the kittel, the white garment. We do seven hakafot with the lulav and etrog. We're up all night saying the book of Tehillim. It's a day of tshuva, okay? And then it goes, that. that's how we go into Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah, Rabbi Nachman teaches this, by the way, that at the on the evening prayer of, the Marev prayer of Simchat Torah, when we finish the Kriyat Shema and we start going the Emunah Korzot, that's when a person's parnasa is decreed for the entire year. So Hoshana Rabbah, the night of Simcha Torah is still concluding, the finalizing the judgment. So technically the, the year begins when? On the day, the morning of Simcha Torah. Now pay attention. The, when we heard what happened, and we, and we saw after, you guys after the second day of Yom Tov, us after Shabbat in Eretz Yisrael, and we heard the stories and videos. What time were they mentioning? What was the time they mentioned that the Arabs came in, then they came in, they came in? 6.30, 6.32, 6.35. What time was Nets in Eretz Yisrael? The, early, the earliest time to daven Shacharit? 6.35, 6.34, 6.36. At Nets. As if Hashem didn't wait even a second. The beginning of the year, already they took the car, like, like they, they pulled the carpet from under our feet. Boom. All hit Behelem. Okay. So like the beginning of the year was already with this, with this fist. What is the message? What was the message? Many rabbis are giving different interpretations. Okay, one says this, one says that. We're here to give a breast of perspective of what in the world 
It's happened. We still haven't settled. <laughs> I just came back from the airport in Tel Aviv. It's dead. Airport is dead. And on that ramp, if you remember how it works in Tel Aviv, there's the ramp of arrivals and departures. So they covered the whole place with the pictures of the hostages. So you can only cry. You're only crying when you're just walking down that pathway. You're just, and everyone's down and everyone's, you know, sad. And it's just, okay. But what are we supposed to do? What's the message? So let's take a look. When did this atrocity happen on one of the happiest days of the year? Simchat Torah. Rabbi Nachman once told Rav Nosin, his disciple, did you dance the Simchat Torah? Were you happy? And he said, I was so happy this year, Rabbi Nachman said about himself, that I danced even by myself in my room. And Rabbi Nosin says, if you think about it, that the dancing of Simchat Torah, why are we dancing on Simchat Torah? Because we're showing our appreciation of how happy we are that we're a Jew. What does that mean that I'm happy that I'm a Jew? That I, there's a value in every single tiny thing I do. What value? It's an eternal value. Meaning what? When a Jew does a mitzvah, it's etched for eternal. That's it. You said a bracha 25 years ago at some concert. It was a Pink Floyd concert and you were drinking a Mountain Dew and you said a bracha. It's etched. Okay. It's etched forever. It's it. It's etched. It's, it's stored away eternally. Okay. It's yours. Okay, every tiny atillim you said 10 years ago, 15 years ago, five, it's never lost. So because of that, as a Jew, you have what to be happy about. The goyim or this world, they don't have what to be happy about because it's all empty. Oh, I took my family to Club Med and Club This and Monaco. And uh, and then life goes on and it's forgotten. Okay, it was that. But a Jew who did a kiddush for a baby that was born 20 years ago or a bris or there was a, a chasana and a wedding and all that stuff, it's etched forever. It's forever. It's eternal. So we have what to be happy about because it's never going to be taken away. That's it's, it's called an eternal simcha. It's what really to be happy about, okay? So Rav Nosseni wrote that really when you think about it, we have every reason to be happy about our Yiddishkeit. That we have a merit to connect to something that has meaning and an eternal meaning. And that's the idea of the simcha of simcha Torah. So this atrocity happened on one of the happiest days of the year where we're supposed to be happy, okay? Number one. Number two, the first news that we all got, everyone, was the rave of those teenagers, those poor kids, 3,000 children, okay? Half of them, anyways, brought up not religious. So what do you want from them? They never tasted what it means to really be really happy about being a Yid. What do you want? And number two, there were also kids there who grew up religious, but the attitude was always being tough. You have to serve Hashem and this, and they fell off because they couldn't handle that. And all of them were looking for Simcha from another direction. If it's to smoke acid or to have a concert on Shabbat, on Yom Tov, what do you want? But they were looking for happiness in a different format. Number three, one of the biggest painful things were the hostages, right? In the Torah, where do you see the punishment of hostages mentioned? In Parashat Kitavu. Parashat Kitavu are 98 curses. Amongst them, and please forgive me if I don't remember the exact wording of the verse, but it's something like Banecha Uvnotecha Bashevi. Your children, your sons, and daughters will be taken hostages. And in the middle of the 98 curses, it gives the reason. What's the reason? Tachat Hashem lo avadetat Hashem elokecha besimcha uvtuv levav. Hashem says, Why are you going to be punished with these punishments? Not because you're not serving me, but because you're not serving me besimcha, besimcha again. So there's a message that comes out here. What's missing? What has to be done? What's the message here? What's the message here? So again, many rabbis, Mekubalim and Sadiqim are saying all types of things. But from a Rabbi Nachman perspective, on a positive, constructive perspective, if you want to say it like that, it seems the message is that we have to be besimcha more. Because like Rabbi Nachman explains, exile, the definition of exile, and the intent of the nations who persecute the Jews in exile, what's their intent? To make us sad. I mean, this damn Arab, so to say like that, he takes the Facebook of the grandmother showing her grandchildren how, how he's killing the grandmother, okay? What's his intent? He wants to make her feel bad. And what does it mean to make her feel bad? To feel sad. In other words, sadness is the goal of the evil and the wanting to hurt. It's to make you feel bad. When the Nazis, they weren't happy just to kill the Jews. They wanted to make them feel like, like low lives. They have a number. They're not even a human being to break their morale. Why, why? Just kill. If you're so against it, you just kill him. Why also to break the morale? Because what is he really after? He's after to make the person feel bad and sad. 
So Rav Nosson explains the essence of Galut is Atzvut. Meaning what then? What is Geula? What is the opposite? What is the goal? Is to be Bisimcha. So when we allow, when the going, they, they feel like they're bringing us down and we express hatred, anger in, 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 in return and showing that we're, we're built up, they're so happy. So then what is the attitude? To be even more happy. <laughs> because when you're happy, they didn't make a dent into you. When you show that I'm not even happier, you're trying to bring me down, <laughs> you're not going to work. Because I'm in eternal existence. I'm a Jew. I have a connection to something which is eternal. My mitzvah performance, my connection to Hashem is something eternal. And that you can't even touch. I just have to remember it. You're, you're here to remind me of what I really have to do, which is to be the simcha. So it seems with everything that happened until now, and again, the year hasn't even begun. They say the first stage of the year is after Hoshana Rabbah Simcha Torah. And the next Tachana, the next stop is Zot Hanukkah, the, day of, the last day of Hanukkah. So we're hoping, B'zat Hashem, that we will get back on our feet and we have to get back on our feet. To say, no, but you have to remember what happened and you can't just let this pass, that's true. But the attitude I have to take has to be a positive one. If I'm just going to stay mourning and mourning and negative, I didn't get anywhere. Plus, when they try to say that these are the signs of Mashiach, the signs of Mashiach, Rabbi Nachman teaches Mashiach won't come out of pain and negativity and suffering. Mashiach doesn't come like that. The Pasuk says clearly, Ki besimcha tetzeu. Out of joy, through joy, will you come out of exile. So this is not the sign yet. Okay, the sign is like the prophecy. The prophet says that when the goyim will be so happy about us, the goyim are going to bring us back to Eretz Yisrael. Okay, and they will say, like we say in Shemalot on Shabbat, Higdel Hashem lasot im ele, Higdel Hashem lasot imanu hainu semechim. The verse is talking on behalf of the nations. As yomu bagoyim, then in the future, the goyim, the nations are going to say amongst themselves, Psh, wow. He did so many big wonders for these people, the Jewish nation. And by doing good for them, He is really good for us. And the Goyim are going to say, So we're happy. Because if it's good for the Jews, remember the Vidal Sassun? If you don't look good, we don't look good. Vidal Sassun. You remember that? I have to make some jokes. We have to make some jokes to be happy. In other words, if the Jews look good, we look good. Okay, Vidal Sassun. I'm sorry, I have to say that. Whoever got it, okay? But, but the point is, that the goyim through simcha are going to appreciate us and the Mashiach will come in that attitude. So we know that what's happening now, it's still a preparation stage. But they start calculating, oh, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. It's not the sign yet. Okay, it's not the sign. The sign is that of intense simcha bezat Hashem. When the nations will wake up and they see that they have a value because we have a value and they're happy for us and they're happy for them because of us, then that's the sign bezat Hashem. So now, in connection to this, this is one of the most fundamental teachings, and we spoke about this many times already. I'm here already, I think, uh, the last two times, two years I've been here already, and the main focal point is on the power of simcha, because it's true. If you maintain and build such a positive attitude in your life, and you're always positive, you will see how Hashem is opening the doors for you time after time, after time. It's unbelievable. And it's true that Simcha leads you up to the highest levels. So we want to continue this idea. What does Simcha really bring you to? In the Kabbalah, there's this concept of what's called the Keter. Keter means the crown. Okay? In the Kabbalah, this concept of the Keter basically means on a practical level, accessing Hashem's light at the highest level possible, meaning the infinite light. Okay? Now that is humanly possible because a human who's finite is limited and Hashem is infinite to opposites. You can't expect someone who's physical and finite to connect to something, someone, an existence who's infinite because it'll just disappear. So, but, and yet Hashem wants that to happen. Hashem wants these two opposites to connect and to be able, with that connection, to have a harmonious existence. But it can't be fixed. So that means, first of all, to explain what, what, what does this mean on a practical level? 
the word for light in Hebrew is Or, Aleph, Vav, Resh. Aleph is in Gematria is one, Vav is six, so that's seven, and Resh is 200, 207. 207 is also the Gematria of Ein Sof, the infinite light. What does that mean? Whenever in your lifetime, you have what's called a high, a spiritual high. You have a light. Everyone goes through this. Everyone in their lifetime, whether it was in high school or university, or when he became, started doing tshuva, and he was having a big push forward, every, and, or a davening that really opened you up, or a Lagba Omer festival, and you just felt like you were flying, okay, whatever. A Shlomo Karlebach experience, whatever. Each person in a different format. Everyone experiences a type of light in their life, and then it's taken away. And then that leaves you with a feeling I have to run after it. After, after experiencing such an exposure, I can't now continue living my regular life and just forget about that. I want to pursue it. It's like a verse in, 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 in Song of Songs, Shir Shirim. Moshcheni acharecha narutza. Hashem, he sends a light to a person as if to draw you close. And now because of that experience, I'm going to run after you now. So this happens to every person. This is what builds people's aspirations. Whether Jew or non-Jew, they have an aspiration because there's some light that woke them up. This is amazing. I want to run after this. And it's taken away, okay? So now there's obviously many misleading formats of this light. And we believe that the proper experience of this light is the format of Torah, observance, Judaism, connecting to Hashem, okay? But... How this happens to a person is that it's touching and not touching. In other words, I experience it and it's taken away. And why does Hashem do that? He allows you exposure to a, a, a light, a bliss, which is above your true level. It's above your level. You're not ready for that. But you're, taste, you're given a taste of it so that you know it exists. And, and that, that gives you now motivation, what I'm running after, what, I, what I'm pursuing now. It gives me a direction in life now. And that's good. That's positive. But now it, it requires a lot of work, obviously. Now, in other words, you're now back in your mode where there's no light. And now you want to rebuild to connect to it. So he teaches Rabbi Nachman, the way for this to happen, for a person to reconnect to this light, that I should have that feeling again, but on a higher level, is by building and working on this attribute of Simcha. Okay? Simcha allows me to connect to this level called the Keter. By the way, why is this crown, this word crown, why is this the term used for the access of the infinite light? Because like a crown, what does a crown do on the head of a king? A crown symbolizes that there is a differentiation between the people, the nation, and the king. When he has the king has like a round crown, it's like a boundary, it's like a wall, a separation. I'm the king, I'm wearing the crown, and you're the nation, and there's a difference. There's a wall between me and you reflected in the boundaries of the crown. So too, the Keter is what separates mankind from Hashem's infinite light. But like we said, Hashem wants there to be a connection. Why does Hashem want that connection? Because the whole reason why Hashem created the world is that people should experience His, his goodness, His kindness. Hashem wants, He created the world that people should realize what's good. Okay, but you have to earn it. You have to work for it. So, but he allows people to experience it, to know that it exists, and then it's taken away. So now I have what to run after. So Rabbi Nachman teaches, the key for this is simcha. And it's in a verse. There's a verse quoted by the Gemara. When the Gemara tells the story that when the Jews, this is Gemara on Shabbat, page 88. When the Jews, they were at Har Sinai to receive the Torah, and they said the proclamation, Na'asevenishma, we will do and we will listen, we will listen. So the Gemara says 600,000 angels came and they put two crowns on the head of each Jew. Okay. And because of the sin of the golden calf, these two, two crowns were taken away. One million two hundred thousand angels came, double now, to take away these crowns. And the Gemara goes on to say, but in time to come in the future, Hashem will give back these crowns to the Jewish people, like the verse reads. The joy that was always there, Simchat Olam, the joy of the light of these crowns, Al Rosham will be restored back on their heads. In our context, Simchat Olam means a Jew, even though he's in this physical world and he goes through the mundanity and the difficulty, 
having to get up in the morning and to make the eggs and to go to work and to, to do this and in mundanity and yet be expected to try to be happy in his connection to Hashem, to find how to connect Hashem to be happy about it. That's called Simchat Olam. I'm happy while still in this physical world. If I maintain, if I succeed in having that joy, Al Rosham, I get to the crown. I get to the Keter. I get back that light, which I tasted 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and I'm waiting for it to come back. If now I maintain consistency in being happy and serving Hashem, Hashem will expose me to the highest levels of existence. Okay? This is, in a nutshell, the perspective of the whole creation as what it's meant to be. Now, why in our generation, it's a necessity now. We can't do without this now. Okay? To explain. The Torah, as we know it, has four sections. They're called pardes. Pshat, remez, drash, sod. Four levels of the Torah, meaning pshat is the simple meaning of the Torah. The simple laws, the chumash, the gemara, the mishnayot, the code of Jewish law, halacha, that's called basic, basic Torah. To know what to do. How to put on the tefillin, the, all the halachot, how to light the candles for Shabbat, how to make challah, what the bracha to say. All that is called pshat. Remez, is now on a deeper level of finding hints of the moralistic messages in the Torah. You find hints here and there that the Torah gives to us. Drash is something deeper, where now I'm able to discover something which was hidden and to bring it out and to show this wonderful new insight and idea, which wasn't there on the revealed level, but I'm able to bring it out also for the moralistic level. The fourth level, which is considered the highest level, is Sod, the Kabbalistic secrets of the Torah. Okay? These four levels of the Torah, believe it or not, correspond to the four exiles that we have gone through in history. The four exiles, as you know, the first one was the exile of Egypt, Mitzrayim. The second was what, Babylonia, Babel. The third one coming up, Hanukkah, Yavan, the Greeks. And number four, the one that we're in now in the present, Edom, the Roman exile, which will extend until Mashiach comes. Look at the names of these four exiles and the corresponding part of the Torah that combats each one. The first exile is called Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim means what? Mitzer, that a person is squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. What's like what the Egyptians did? Paro did that. He first convinced the Jews doing one thing, and once he cornered them there, he cornered them more and squeezed them more until they became total slaves, okay? That's the idea of a Mitzrayim. Back then, the Jews technically were on such a high level that the basic level of Torah observance was enough, strong enough to give them life and, and, and hope and energy to connect to Hashem. That was enough for them. The pshat was enough for them. Okay? But that lasted until the second exile, Babylonia, Babel. Babel is from the Lashon of Bilbul, confusion. Bilbul. Okay? Meaning what? The idea of the second exile, Babylonia, Ah, you're now serving Hashem? So let's throw you off a little. Let's test you now in the second exile to make you a type of confusion so you don't know anymore what's right and what's wrong. You could be serving Hashem, knowing the halachot, but if my head is not there, it's not in the right place. There's a bilbul. So I need now something more that's in the Torah already that can enhance my connection to Yiddishkeit and Torah. So back then, the, the, the level of remez, showing hints, which also means like gematria, and that this word is equal to that word, and you can connect this to that, <clears throat> and you see the connection, wow, that's amazing. That shows me that this is really divine, and there's meaning, and there's hope. I have enough strength, and that, that was the case. The Jews in Bavel, the next level of Remez was enough to sustain them. Yavan, which translates as Yeven Mitsula, quicksand. Yavan, the word for the Greek, the Yavanim, comes from quicksand. That what? You're in your place, but you're getting sucked in. You can't move now. You're really now sinking and sinking. Like, there's nothing to hold on. For that, the level of drash became revealed. The midrashim, if you take a look, their starting point was in the time of the Yavanim, of the second temple, the beginning of the second temple. Drash was needed to give hope to Jewish people who felt they were drowning. Drowning. Because the Yavanim, they, they came, no Shabbat, no Brit Milah, no learning Torah, like the communists, like the, like the Russians. And what can you do? So you need you needed a higher level of Torah 
to wake up people, to get them to connect, okay? Finally, Edom, Edom is similar to the word for Medame. Medame means now, this is the hardest exile, a convolution, a, a distortion of the faculty of the imagination, Medame, that you see something and it's not really that. It's something else. It's false. That now this exile is able so much, especially now with AI, <laughs> to really mess up people's imaginations. That you see something, but it's not really that. And you see something that's not really that? And they make you so frustrated. That's the word of this exile. The frustration is the, is the makkah, is the plague, is the difficulty of this final exile. Okay? For that was necessary the yeah. revelation of the Kabbalah, the Arizal, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the Zohar, which now takes people to, wow, the level of esoteric and mystical, that for sure pushes the person up, okay? But now we're at the end of the fourth exile, and we look at the situation of Am Yisrael. We've suffered so much now, and we've gone through so much. We reached a point now that the majority of the Jewish people in the world don't know what Kriyat Shema is, don't know what Shabbat is. The assimilation, as it is today, has never been at this extremity. So what's going on? We have Pshat, Remez, Drash, Sod, and yet it's not enough to wake up the Jewish people. It's not enough. And the answer is yes, something higher is needed. The fifth dimension of the Torah, a higher dimension. This is hinted to, the fifth dimension, in Hashem's holy name, Yud K Vav K. In Yud Kevavke, you also have the four levels of the Torah. So let's go from, from highest to lowest. The Yud, no, you know, let's go from the bottom. Hey, the, let's go to the last hey. Hey is the idea of the Pshat, the, the simple level of the Torah. That's why it's the last letter. It's the, the, the beginning point. Vav is the idea of the Remez, the hints of the Torah. And the first hey is the Drash. And the first Yud is the idea of the Kabbalah. Now, when a Sofer in the Sefer Torah writes, Yud ke vav ke, okay? On the first letter Yud, the sofa has to do what's called a little kotz, a little extension on the roof of the letter Yud. The letter Yud looks like there's a roof, and then it goes down to the right. The sofa, when he makes the top leg, the, part, the top roof of the letter Yud, he has to make a little, little extension down. Not too much, because if he does it too much, it looks like the letter Chet. That's forbidden. You ruin the letter. He has to extend, it's called Kotza Deot Yud, which refers to a fifth level of the Torah. And this is the level of the Keter, the level of the infinite light. Okay, this light means, what does that mean on a practical level? A level of Torah that when you learn it, you feel immediate light. You feel, wow, I finally find someone or something who's explaining Torah teachings that relate directly to me even though I'm in my mess, I'm in all the upside downness of my life, I have all the frustrations and confusions and everything that I can't find myself clearly, and yet Torah teachings that go down to my level and relate to me and pull me up, wow, that's unbelievable. This is the power of the level of the Keter, okay? So this level of Keter is what's needed now at this last leg of Edom. We're now suffering the last leg of Edom. And right before the coming of Mashiach, this fifth level of Torah is what's needed. Now, what is that on a practical level? If you take a look at history, let's take a look at history. The, the idea of assimilation and reform Judaism, which means letting people to let go, that you don't have to be so observant like you thought you did all these years. You can also be a Jew and be connected and live like the nations. What's the problem? Okay, this started in the mid-1700s, the same time that the Baal Shem Tov came into the world. The Baal Shem Tov, Hasidut in general, came to reveal a level of Torah that even a Jew, as broken as he is, as far as he is, can have a connection to Hashem. What? Even me? The guy who was the janitor cleaning the toilets? Even me, I can connect to Hashem? Because until then... Who had the, 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 the merit to feel connection to God? The guys who were learned, the guys who were tzaddikim, the guys who were big shots, they had godliness. And the poor people, the, the little people had nothing. No, nothing. They just had to follow the flock. Came along the Baal Shem Tov, 
and show that there's a way to connect every single Jew. And that's the greatness. The greatness of the Torah is to be able to show even the lowest Jew that there's light in his life and he matters and there's what to do to reconnect where he is to bring him up from there. That's a greater level. As opposed to like the, the university way of thinking. You're only a somebody after getting your degree and you have your PhD and your ABC and CDF and whatever. You have all your degrees. Only then you're a somebody. Until then you're a nobody. So now comes the Baal Shem Tov and say, wait, wait, wait. And the poor guy, just because he doesn't have a degree. So he's supposed to be like a shmata for the rest of his life. That's it? No, come on. So the Baal Shem Tov came along to show an opening that every Jew matters. Came along Rabbi Nachman, his grandson, and he enhanced that. He enhanced that even more. He brought down a level of Torah that everyone can connect. And he said about his lessons that my teachings, my fire will burn until the coming of Mashiach. Okay? He made a statement once, Rabbi Nachman, about himself. He said, Ani, it's a song even, Ani ish pele, velishmati pele gado. He said, I am a I am a ish pele. I'm a man of wonder, and my soul is even a bigger wonder. This word pele, the Ramak, Rav Moshe Kordover, who was a big Kabbalist, he explains that the word pele is referring to this fifth level of the Torah, the Keter. Why is, why is the Keter called Pele? The word Pele translates as something which is wondrous, something which is far really removed from a person. Okay, that's the idea of Pele. So Keter, which is removed from us, it's, it's a separation from us, and Pele are synonymous. It's removed, and it's, the crown is holding this light that we mentioned. He said about himself, Rabbi Nachman, I am a man of Pele, meaning what? I'm here to bring people to connect to this highest level of the Torah, because that's the only thing that can help people today. He explains like this, that whenever Hashem sends a type of uh, ailment, a makkah to the world, Hashem doesn't send the makkah until he first sends a refuah. He first sends the healing, the antidote. Where do we see that? Megillat Esther. In Megillat Esther, Rashi says clearly that when Esther Amalka was taken, you know, she was taken by Hashverosh, a Jewish girl, to now live and be married and to, to live together and be together with Hashverosh, which is so, you know, despicable for a Jewish girl. And what did Mordechai say? It can't, this was sent to happen in order to lead a, 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 to a prerequisite before a future difficulty that's going to come. And this is going to be the salvation, which is in fact what happened. Because Esther Malka was the queen, when yeah. Haman made his decree, she was able to mitigate it. Okay? So this, Rashi says, this is a rule in Judaism, in life. That when, whenever Hashem sends a difficulty, even something which the world calls terminal, terminal this, terminal cancer, there has to be some, there has to be a remedy there out there. We just have to find it, and it's there. But Hashem sends it before, okay? So now in this context, he says like this, Rabbi Nachman, that before Hashem sends down to this world big, big tzaddikim to help the Jewish people, okay? He sends along with them a level of darkness in the world that becomes impossible to be saved from the darkness except through these tzaddikim. So meaning, if you try to say, you know, I'm going to live the way my parents lived, my grandparents, my great-grandparents did, I'm going to continue the traditional format of Judaism, and I'm going to manage. It won't work, because the darkness that has descended upon the world is so thick, it's so heavy, that even if you want it to, it won't work out. So then what to do? Hashem sends tzaddikim to balance that darkness, forcing you to go looking for them, for looking for light and hope of the pele, of the, of the level of the keter. But going back to what we said in the beginning, the key to finding these tzaddikim, the key to finding this level of the Torah has to be simcha. Because we said, v'simcha olam al rosham. Simcha is the key for this level of Torah. The question is now, why? Why is simcha the key for this level of the Torah? Because this level of the keter, which we said, it gives you an exposure of light and then it takes it away. When you come looking for it, the normal tendency is to push you back. You get a setback. 
okay? A normal person who gets a setback in their life, what do they say? I don't understand. He's frustrated. I thought I'm doing something good. I'm trying to do more mitzvot. I'm trying to be positive. I'm trying, and Hashem, you push me back. You push me back. But am I doing something bad? Am I a criminal? Am I stealing? No. I'm now trying to put on tefillin every day. I'm trying to get up on time for davening. I'm trying to do shmirat halashon. I'm trying to do chala and slaka and shabbat. And you make me push back like this. So a normal person will take it as such a slap in the face that, okay, so Hashem doesn't want me, so I'll just take off. Whereas if a Jew is working so much on simcha, when he gets this slap in the face and he gets pushed back, he says, this is a preparation for something higher. Because I'm, the happiness doesn't allow you to accept that Hashem is just pushing you away and he doesn't want you. Rather, you realize this is a preparation for a higher level. So in short, simcha is the key for what's called savlanut, patience. You gain patience when you master the, the art of working on being the simcha. Because of that, Rabbi Nachman, he reveals five guidelines on how to be happy. Five rules to being happy where you can use uh, this one or that one or combinations whenever you're stuck. The number one, the big one is telling jokes, acting silly. The jokes I told, okay, Vidal Sassoon, all these type of jokes to make a smile on the face. That That is one way to be happy because it leads, even though it's a silliness, but that silliness will bring you eventually to genuine feeling of happiness. Number two, putting on music, dancing, getting in a mood, getting in a beat. Music is so powerful. Music, they say, relates to the highest level of the Torah. You have what's called tanta. Ta'amim, nekudot. Remind me, please. You got, you remember how it works now? Tevot otiot. Do you remember this? Anyone remember this? I, I, I always forget the third one. Ta'amim, nekudot. Tagin, that's it. Tagin ve'otiyot. There's, on, in, in the letters in the Sefer Torah, you have the cantillation, how you, how you pronounce it. You know, by Omer. Okay, the singing of it. Okay, the, the actual vowel points and the kudot. And then on top of the letters in the separate door, you have crowns, you have tagim, you have lines. Okay, I have certain shatnes gets, you have letters that have crowns. Okay, and then the actual letters. Of them, the highest one is the cantillation. The singing is considered like the fourth level of the Torah, the secrets of the Torah. And, and showing that music, nigun, taps in to a, the depths of a person's neshama and gets him moving. That's why when you hear music, you have to boogie. You have to start moving and it gets you moving because it touches upon very, very deep chords of the neshama leading to simcha. Dancing and music is something very positive. There's no mitzvah, oh, I'm a religious Jew, so I have to be serious and everything's too shall be up. No, there's no mitzvah to be like that, okay? It doesn't work like that. It's a mitzvah to be happy. And if it takes being music, yes, it's music. Gamarnu. In breast of shuls, by the way, all over the world, they dance every morning and every evening. After shacharit, they grab hands Everybody, the old, the, the children, the teenagers, they make a big circle and they dance every day after Shacharit and after Marav, every day, every day, okay? Except for Tisha B'Av, obviously. But, but dancing is a big way to lift up your spirits. Number three is finding your good points. Finding the good points. I'm not as bad as my subconscious is trying to tell me, ah, you're a loser, ah, you're a low life, ah, you don't get out of bed and you don't do this. So that's the Yetzirah talking. Then we have to fight him with, but I do this, but I do that. And he says, yeah, but it's nothing. No, no, but I do it and has a value and finding the good, which is a big work, but it works. Number four is giving thanks to Hashem. Appreciating every tiny thing and saying, thank you, Hashem. Thank you that I woke up. It's not granted. It's not like, oh, I deserve to wake up. How come you didn't wake up on time? Or how come I didn't do this? Everything is thank you, Hashem. And number five, which is very powerful, is looking at the future. What does that mean? If you know that in the end, Hashem's going to have his way. And in the end, everything's going to work out. If you know that in the end, everything's going to work out, so why are you crying now? Why are you sad now? If you know that it's going to work out in the end, your life is like maybe 70, 80, 90 years in this film, which is 6,000 years, okay? So your, your lifespan is just a little film, like a split second of the 6,000 reel of this, of this world history that we call life in this world, okay? And in the end, everything's going to work out. There's going to be resurrection of the dead. You're going to see again your Bubi, your Zaydi, your grandparents, your parents. You're going to see everybody. Everyone's going to be happy. It's going to be positive. It's going to be amazing, the existence. The evil will be destroyed totally. 
So if it's going to work out in the end, why are you crying? Why are you, why are you so negative? The reason why people are negative is because they look at the present in itself, just the present. But he, he teaches that you have to connect the present to the future. If you connect the present to the future, you can always be happy because you always know it's going to work out in the end. In the end, it's going to work out. In the end, the end. There might be another setback, but another an advance, a setback. But in the final end, it's going to work out. It's going to work out. So if that's the case, why do I have to be negative and broken and miserable of the tiny things here and there that are not working out? If I know that in the big picture, it's going to, it's going to be great. Okay. So these are eight sot Rabbi Nachman gives on the power of how to be besimcha. And I can go on a little, but that's just a bit too much. <laughs> the next stage. The, the point I wanted to bring out is that Simcha is the key to reach the higher levels of, of the Torah. That even if a person is sitting and learning a thousand years Torah, if now he doesn't have Simcha in his life, and with the Simcha to know how to face the setbacks of life, he will never experience this level of the Keter. And what we're going through today, with all the setbacks we're going through, pushes us that we have to deal with the level of the Keter. And the way to connect to it is through being Bisimcha. So bottom line, after everything happening in the world, all the craziness of Simcha Torah, and what we each, each as individuals are going through, our main investment should be in being Bisimcha. And with that, we'll finish now. Bezat Hashem, we should work on being Bisimcha and through that, meriting the Keter. And this Keter will eventually be the crown for Mashiach. And with that, Bezat Hashem, we will face the Gula in our lifetime, Bezat Hashem. Oh now, follow up. <laughs> follow up. Last year, I came here, presented a 40 day challenge, and it was an experiment. Most people didn't do it. <laughs> okay, it didn't work. Why? It was too heavy. And we want, I wanted to see how people reacted. These ideas we mentioned tonight are all found in a beautiful lesson that Rabbi Nachman revealed, okay? How Rabbi Nachman's teachings work is that the more you learn them, the more you activate them in your life. It's, um, it's phenomenal. The more you read and, and go over and you absorb again and again and again, they make major changes in your life. Something's wrong with the connection. I just want to say something. The chashmal went down. Yeah. I think it's in the wall. I see that the battery is low. Yeah, okay, good, fine. However, uh, learning Torah, especially this Torah of the Keter, of the Pele, is not enough. You also need prayer. Prayer is the heart. Torah is the mind. And the mind and the heart have to merge. Like the, what we say every day in Alinu Shabbat, V'yadata hayom, V'ashevotah, you, and you shall know and you will know today and bring this knowledge to bring the knowledge to the heart the way a Jew works is we have Torah study and prayer because they have to join the brain and the heart, why? because the brain, learning, education of the Torah awakens in a person the awareness of these items in his life and grants him now access to them but the prayer part which is the hard part is what now actually brings you to actualize it for example a person now god forbid who has like a skin disease okay so he goes to the pharmacy and he buys this ointment okay if he doesn't apply it on the wound it doesn't help he's an idiot <laughs> you buy the ointment but you have to apply it on the wound so too torah of chassidut especially activates remedies that you need in your life but the davening part, asking Hashem to bring these things into my life, is what brings it from potential to actual. So, on these lessons that Rabbi Nachman wrote, Rav Nossin, and his disciple, wrote prayers on these lessons. So you can daven about these ideas. So we, pre we prepared a better, easier format of a 40-day challenge, which I presented last year. But easy, it takes, it takes one minute a day, two minutes a day, going over pieces of Rabbi Nachman's lesson and the prayer on it with the intent of gaining more simcha in your life and gaining more of the keter in your life. So to make it easy for everyone, I made a QR scan right over here. Can someone hand this? Can, Mr. Da can you really please give this up? Please, thank you so much. There's a QR scan.
it joins you directly to the WhatsApp group on this 40 day challenge. And the PDF file is in the description of the, of the, of the WhatsApp group and taste it. I, I personally am doing this lesson for two years already and it works. <laughs> there's, a, there's an enhancement of Simcha in your life. Yes. You want to say? So this is a new one. This is a new one. It's a new one. Exactly. That's why I made it easier. Ah, uh, your WhatsApp. My WhatsApp. So take download the PDF and then leave the WhatsApp group. No, no. I have too many WhatsApp. It's my Okay, so do do yourself a favor. Just enter the WhatsApp group, take the PDF, and then leave the WhatsApp group. Here, scan the QR. There's a QR. There. Now there's a second QR to promote and support what we're doing. This. This is what we what we spoke about tonight is an example of what's called breast of therapy. Because Rabbi Nachman's teachings is really a therapy. It's the keter. It's this final stage before Mashiach comes. It's a healing. And he manages successfully to talk about every area of life that's needed for a person to work on. So to help us in continuing to research these classes that we gave now took a year to prepare. A year, literally a year of ups and downs, all types of crazy things in order to make a presentable uh, composition like we did tonight. So to help support us, you have a second QR scan there and you can get a Canadian tax uh, re refund on, on that donation. And B'zat Hashem, we should see very soon, like we said in the beginning, Ki besimcha Tetzel, with joy, we should leave this Galut. Amen, B'zat Hashem. Thank you.